Abraham. And uh, he's uh, been very faithful in answering God's call, travels over 800 miles, leaves everything behind, uh, and then gets into the land that God promised him. And it turns out that the Taliban are there. Well, they're called Canaanites, but it's kind of the same thing. Uh, the, the, the enemies are in the land. We saw that last week. Uh, it's a land where God takes him, that God forces him to trust him every day. Even as in, in Israel today, uh, their water supply is dependent upon God to bring the rains. And the people there are praying every year that God would bring rain. It's a place God takes them like us. If you really want to walk with me, I'm going to take you to a place that's so hard, you've got to trust me every day. <laughs> and, and sometimes we don't want to do that. We're reluctant to go on and grow. That's this guy's problem in the, in the video clip here. Good morning, Reagan. Good morning. Good morning, Madison. Good morning, Johanna. Good morning, Good morning. Johnny. People are always asking me why. Why do the same thing every year? Why not move on? And I say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Johnny? Present. I'm comfortable. I know the routine. United States of America and to the Republic. And I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty popular around here. I do really well in sports. Well, I'm just very successful here. Why would I go and mess that up by graduating? Me. I mean, in the first grade, I may not know all the answers. D, D, dog, E. The hours are longer. I hear they don't even have nap time. I mean, I just don't see the upside. Then first grade leads to second grade, second to third. Then you're in high school reading boring books with no pictures. Three, four, five. But he was still hungry. Next thing you know, people expect you to get a job and give up summer vacation. <laughs> no, sir. I think I found my niche. Thank you very much. Home sweet kindergarten. Besides, I mean, what if I failed first grade? How humiliating would that be? No, oh, just don't think I can handle that kind of embarrassment. And sometimes wonder why you. That was not a good choice. Very disappointed. <laughs> the writer of Hebrews says, in fact, by this time, some of you ought to be teachers, but instead you need to be taught the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk and not solid food. Well, God takes us to places that cause us to grow. And uh, as we're going to see with Abraham, uh, they're actually severe. So I'm, you know, I can't help but have a little bit of fun with, it, with Abraham. And, uh, but at the same time, I want to realize that what he was going through was very severe. And what he had done up until now was incredibly awesome in terms of his faith. We talked about the city of Ur, the Chaldeans. Went to some place out in the boonies. Wasn't taking care of a couple little sheep out there. He lived in a very sophisticated uh, city, a highly educated, advanced mathematics, housing developments, and so forth. Uh, and, um, uh, of course, with that, this false religious system, we uh, saw pictures of the, of the ziggurat, the top of which where they worshipped the moon god. And, of course, through uh, uh, Woolley's uh, excavation, found the royal tombs and the remains of the human sacrifices that would have taken place in that place of worship. That's, that's the life of a Abraham. In terms of creature comforts, he would have had no wants. It's probably the most modern, most sophisticated city on the planet at the time. And we're, we're, again, we're talking the excavation from about 2500 BC. He leaves everything to follow God who appeared to him and said, follow me, even though he has no idea where he's going. Goes up river, of course, to Haran and is there until his father, Terah, or Terah, dies and then God once again follow me and he makes it into the land and then God says this is the land I promised you this will be your land uh, for you and your descendants and of course but it's not an easy place it may have not have been what he really had in mind 
Sometimes our own walk with the Lord is like that. We're following the Lord. We're in the center of God's will. And we think then because of that, it's just going to kind of level off here. But God will bring those difficulties, severe things uh, in our lives sometimes. He doesn't want to leave us in kindergarten. Looks pretty good for the little kids there. Looks pretty, uh, pretty weird for the big guy, right? Uh, and we don't want to be like that spiritually. James, uh, the Lord's uh, brother says, and James 1, 2, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing. So James says that we should even count it a joy. Still working on that one. Count it a joy when we fall into, again, severe trials. We're not talking a flat tire on the freeway or... Uh, they're not having your favorite specialty at the restaurant you like to go to. We're talking about real severe trials. Uh, and James says you can come to a point if you have an understanding of what God's doing where you can actually count it joy. Well, let's take a look as uh, Abraham refused to trust God's promise in verse 10. Now, there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And I'm using the word refuse. Abram refused to trust uh, in a time of severe circumstances. Uh, I could have used the word reluctant. He was just reluctant. It's not that at this point he stops loving God or believing in God or anything like that. He just has really forgotten how great God is and that God made certain promises to him and would have cared for him if it remained. Now, the Hebrew word here for severe means heavy or a heavy burden. Uh, so it's a burden too heavy to bear. God places on Abraham what seems to be a burden that is too heavy to bear. So we're talking about a severe situation. And, uh, and what he did then was what everybody else was doing, what would have been natural to do. Again, the Nile was uh, in Egypt, so it could be uh, irrigated. They never suffered a famine. And we'll, we'll see it later in the book of Genesis, of course, during the time of Joseph being down there. When there's a severe famine, you just go to Egypt. They've always got food there. Also keep in mind that Abraham probably never experienced a famine before in his life. And uh, we're watching a famine on the news, right, on the Horn of Africa. We see those kids and we see what's going on. That's, that's the image here. That's the image when we talk about a severe trial. Abraham's not only got a responsibility for just he and his wife, he's got a whole entourage of people now that have followed him all the way from Iran. We saw that, uh, we saw that last week. He's got responsibilities, and there's kids that seem like they're starving if he doesn't do something. So he does what comes natural, and that is go down to Egypt. Uh, there's one Egyptian inscription that reads, uh, Certain of the foreigners who know not how they may live have come. Their countries are starving. And so it was, the, he just did what was, what was natural. Uh, again, refuse may be too strong, just reluctant. Uh, he was still believing God. He probably still loved God. He was happy to be in, he just wasn't thinking it through. God had promised I'm going to take you, I'll provide for you, and I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make you a blessing to others. But uh, it was difficult for him to remain. And sometimes, certainly, we're like that as well. God had permitted the famine. There's no record that would indicate that uh, Abraham had ever faced anything like this. Because, again, in Ur of the Chaldeans, you had that same situation where you have flatlands, and you have a fresh water supply, you can irrigate, therefore you're always going to have food on the table. So it was something unlike anything he'd ever faced uh, before. So he just did what came naturally, and he did not seek God's will. Now last week we left off, he's at that altar, Bethel, the house of God. He's proclaiming the name of the Lord and so forth. But some time passed, this happens, and there's not that continual fellowship with the Lord. Notice also he refused to trust, and we see the phrase going down to uh, Egypt, which uh, is always an indication of walking away from the promises of God. In the Bible, Egypt becomes, again, a place of bondage, a place that's a type of the world and so forth, as we see it referenced in the New Testament many times. 
Uh, but the other thing that we see here is that it's not the only time that it happens, but God is always instructing not to go there. Uh, over in Genesis chapter 26, uh, later in the story, there was a famine in the land. Besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, the one we're reading about now. His son is Isaac, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. Don't do what your father did. Don't, don't go there. Don't, don't bail out at this, this point. I know it's tempting, and it seems like it's a natural thing to do. It's what everybody is doing. It's an acceptable thing to do culturally, uh, but don't walk away from me at this point. Again, not denying God. He simply forgot him and how great he, uh, he was. So again, going down to Egypt is a reference to doubting God's promises and basically running to some other source of, uh, of help and, uh, uh, and so forth. And it's so, it's so easy to do when there isn't money for the mortgage or money for the rent or the job loss or whatever it's, uh, it might be when there's that sickness and, uh, and uh, there's no answer from the doctors and so forth. Those are the kind of, again, severe trials. Uh, it's so easy to just... You know, and I can just tell you, if, if I could figure this out in my own mind, how to work this thing out, then I'm okay trusting the Lord. <laughs> it's because I'm not really trusting the Lord. If I can figure out how to manage the situation apart from God, I'm okay. And, uh, and that's what he's doing, is we're going to, uh, to see. When we're going through these trials, we have a tendency to say, how can I get out of this? But the question should be, what can I get out of this? Because God doesn't want to give us something out of it. He's trying to build our faith. One writer has said, The will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. And this was God's will, that this famine come. And sometimes severe trials are God's will for us as well. So Abraham refused to trust God's promises. He turns from the will of God. It was what came natural. And, uh, and it resulted, we see, in greater sin in verse 11 to 13. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. Nice, Abraham. All right. The uh, girls are all going, boo, at this point. The results, again, uh, would be this scheme. Now, you know, we often don't think of Abraham as a schemer. You know, if you study the Bible a little bit, you recognize that uh, his grandson, Jacob, was totally the, the, the schemer. In fact, his name, Jacob, means um, dirty, sneaky thief. I mean, uh, I would like to have that for a name, you know, to go around, hey, nice to meet you, dirty, sneaky thief, and uh, I can't, I can't keep my eye on you. It's heel catcher, but that's literally, literally what it means. That's why God has to deal with him in his own, and we'll get to him eventually. He was constantly scheming and trying to figure things out on his own apart from God. He kind of got the God thing. He got the blessings coming from Abraham. You're going to do great things. I get that, but I'll figure this out down here myself, Lord. And, uh, and but we don't think of Abraham in, in that way. But he is scheming, uh, and it's not a scheme that he suddenly came up. Actually, he had it in his back pocket all along. Later in verse, uh, chapter uh, 20, verse 13, it says, And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, Abraham's little sound bite uh, from Abraham, that I said to her, that is to his wife Sarai, This is your kindness that you should do for me. In every place, wherever we go, say, He's my brother. <laughs> so, so it wasn't like, uh, so this is from the get-go. The leave her of the Chaldeans. Apparently, his wife is, is a knockout, and so he's a little concerned that uh, people might come along and go, think she's really beautiful, I'm kind of the ruler in the area, so kill him, take her to be my wife. Uh, apparently, those, those things happened in those days. So right from the beginning, Abraham's a schemer. Lord, I'll follow you, I'll trust you, I'll go wherever you want me to go. 
But just in case, <laughs> I've got a few little plans of my own. And none of us ever do that, of course. We're just totally trusting the Lord always, no matter what. But that's our tendency, isn't it? To, you know, I trust the Lord, I love the Lord, but uh, Lord, if it looks like you're not really going to work this thing out the way I figure you should be working it out, then I got it. Uh, I've got something here in my hip pocket. I've got a plan. So we're good, Lord, because I, I got some backup here. And that's what Abraham was doing. Notice God is constantly saying to him, to Abraham, I will, I will bless you. I will make your descendants. I will give you. Suddenly Abraham is saying, they will, and they will do this, and they will decide this. Notice the change in his attitude as well. He moved from others to self. Why does he want her to lie? Well, so that he won't be killed. Uh, And in fact, he certainly should have never taken Sarah to Egypt, it placed her life in great danger uh, because he did know her beauty. And he knew that obviously right from the beginning, this could become uh, a real issue. Uh, In terms of, keep in mind, she's about 65 years old at this point, but it's not just Abraham. I know sometimes husbands say, and as they should, their wife is the most beautiful woman in the world, as they should, but sometimes It's just their perspective. But it wasn't just Abraham's perspective. At 65, apparently, uh, Sarai was uh, incredibly beautiful because the Egyptians agree and seem to think so. One thing to keep in perspective is Abraham lives to be 175. Sarah lives to be 127. So she's equivalent to might be our 30s or our 40s. There's also a little cultural side note that I came across this week that I had never thought through or seen before that I thought was uh, very interesting and in terms of wh- why would Abraham come up with this scheme to start with right from the beginning? Well, uh, according to one, uh, one uh, expert, Naham Sarna, he writes, where there is no father, the brother assumes legal guardianship of his sister, particularly with respect to obligations and responsibilities in arranging marriage on her behalf. Therefore, whoever wished to take Sarai to, uh, to wife would have to negotiate with her brother. So this is just a little backup. It's pretty smart, Abraham. And he says, listen, we get down there, we get in a little bit of trouble, we get into one of these situations where it looks like somebody wants you to be your wife, the future wife. Uh, If they think I'm the husband, they're gonna kill me. So let's just do this. Let's just say that uh, you're my sister. Because in reality, well, she was, wasn't she? And uh, Moses doesn't tell us that in the beginning as he introduced us to this little family. It starts out following it. But he waits to chapter 20 to kind of drop the bombshell. Oh, by the way, they have the same father but different mothers. It truly was his his half-sister. So he says, so it's not really a lie. We're just not saying all the truth. It is really true that you're my sister in that sense. So we'll say that. And that way, if we run into one of these situations, they'll have to come to me. They'll have to negotiate with me. We'll kind of work this out and give us a little time to get out of here and hit the road. Everything will be all right. This is really a good little backup plan. It's good to have a backup plan, right? I mean, it's good to trust the Lord, but you've got to have a little backup in case he doesn't come through, right? Wrong. But do you understand what Abraham was doing? Because it, it, it's like us. Uh, we don't forget God or not love God or whatever, but just as believers on this journey of faith with him, there's just times when... A trial is so severe that we're going we're gonna to figure out how to get through it apart from God because we can't really fully trust him. Uh, and that's the issue with Abraham and sometimes with us. But notice what happens. There's a refusal to trust God's promises, turns away from the will of God. There's a compromise then that leads to a greater sin. And uh, that eventually then leads to being rebuked by a pagan king. Verse 14, so it was when Abram went into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and committed her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you've done to me? 
Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So Abram is rebuked because his little plan doesn't work out. I want to suggest that that will always be the case. <laughs> God, God will make sure it doesn't work out uh, when, you, when you're out on your own and scheming your way uh, through life. Alan Redpath, one of my favorite writers, says that God never allows his children to sin successfully. Yeah, you can go off and do your thing and sin, but I'm just telling you, it's not really going to work out in the long run. The little scheme, the little has truth. Well, it's kind of the truth. It's just not really all the truth. It's kind of really, you know, you're, you're just going to get busted in the end. God's going to uh, not allow you to get away with it. Abram had forgotten one thing. It was a guy named Pharaoh who they considered God, no negotiation, <laughs> you notice there's no negotiation. It's like, yeah, he might like her, take her. Okay, that didn't really work. That didn't really go the way he thought it was going to go. And that's, that's the case when we're out there on our own. One writer says that she, uh, she well have could have lived and died in Egypt, had her place in a royal tomb, and her excavated mummy would be grinning up at us at the British Museum. Good job, Abram. <laughs> this could have, uh, she's the one, Messiah is going to come through her, all the promises of God. The redemption, the salvation of all the world is riding on this little couple. Okay, not too good. You know, one of the things that's interesting about this is that even in his walking away from the will of God, even in his lying and now sinning and compromising and risking the health and the well-being of his wife and his family and everybody that's with him, God's still there watching out. Pretty amazing, huh? God, God is going to let him kind of mess up and pay some of the consequences, and we're going to see that. He's going he's to get a ruler on the back of the knuckles here from, from God as we go along with this. There's going to be a reminder and a price to pay for all of this, but God still, in terms of his plan for Abram, the picture of redemption and how he wanted to use his life, God is still going to keep directing and bringing, and he's going to isn't that amazing that God, in a sense, goes with us in our rebellion? He goes with us in our sin and waits and patiently. And then if he even has to, in this case, supernaturally intervenes to direct us back to him himself. It's an incredible picture of, uh, of God's grace. Well, are things working out for Abraham? Well, in one sense, he's got a couple of nice rides. And I, I got to, I, just for a guy thing, I have to explain this. You know, as you're reading the text, it's like, you're reading along and male donkeys and, da, 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 and female donkeys. Can't you just say donkeys? I'm just, you know, do we have to? Re but the reason for that is because uh, male donkeys uh, have some real behavioral problems, apparently. I don't know if that's a reflection on all males. But uh, uh, then the female donkeys were used for riding as opposed to being beast of burden. But there weren't too many of them around. So if you had a female donkey to be able to ride on, it was status. It was an indication of your own wealth. It was, it was a Mercedes. It was a Lexus. You know, there, was, there were some rich people that had them. There wasn't a lot of them around. Not only that, and then it's saying camels. Now, we've, we picture these guys, and even our, our little PowerPoint slide, we've got if everybody's on camels. Not everybody was on camels. Camels, at this time, historically, where we're, where we're at, is the brand new domesticated animal that is just being introduced to this part of the world. It was very rare. Not too many people had a camel to ride on. It was, you're right, it was a Lamborghini or something like that. I mean, this, this was a hot ride. I mean, it was the ultimate status symbol. So Abraham, he's, you know, one says he's coming out pretty good on this, right? I mean, it didn't really go the way he thought, but he's got... He's got a couple of Mercedes, a couple of Lexus. He's got, a, he's got maybe a few Lamborghinis and some other, maybe a, a Porsche. I don't know if it was the front porch or the back porch, but he's, he's got one of them. Uh, and somebody could be looking at this and saying, well, not bad, Abraham. Yeah, but he's also the guy wondering how things are going for his beautiful wife that is now living in the palace. And uh, I bet there was a few sleepless nights over that. And there are, aren't they, when we walk away from the Lord. We do things and we compromise and there's a little half truth that we think we're getting away with. And some of the things are kind of working out and it's really okay. 
this job that I knew I shouldn't have taken, but there's some benefits from it or whatever it might be. But at the same time, there's some sleepless nights over this whole thing too because it's killing my family or it's killing my witness or it's killing whatever I thought I was going to do and how I might be used by the Lord. But notice again the rebuke. It's from a pagan king. It results in God's intervention in terms of this plague. And the Hebrew construction stresses the severity of the plague. And so you've got Pharaoh's household overwhelmed by a plague where there was something visible like a skin disease, boils, or whatever it might have been, but it was severe. And everyone had it except one person, this new person they just brought in, Sarai. Everybody's got it. Why don't you have it? I'm pretty sure it's a judgment from God. Which God would that be exactly? Uh, the one of my husband and I, your husband. Oh, I see. And, and again, they understood enough to know that it was something supernaturally going on. They understood the cause of it. So now you get Abraham. Isn't it great that he's being a blessing to all the nations? Actually, he's bringing plagues to all the nations. But that's really not God's intention, right? Does God want to use us to bless other people or bring plagues? <laughs> well, when we're out of God's will. I'm sorry, am I the only one relating to this here? I just kind of feel like I'm preaching to myself here a little bit. Yeah. I'm, you guys, you're so spiritual. You never go through any of this stuff. Uh, you never have this impact on other people at all. You know? But I do. Man, I find myself when I'm not in God's will, and if I'm willing to compromise a little, God will bless me. And instead of being a blessing to other people, I'm just a plague. And it ends up being a reflection on my own relationship with the Lord and the, the nature and the character and the reputation of God. But again, we see it in the scriptures. Jonah, of course, uh, one of the classic examples of a prophet in the Old Testament who refused to do God's will as well. Remember, not wanting to go to Nineveh and, and prophesy over it because the people might repent and might be saved by God. He hates their guts. He doesn't want that to happen. So he gets on a ship and sails as far the other way as possible. That worked out really well for the guys on the ship, right? In terms of this little storm comes and they all think they're going to die. And now they have to throw all their cargo over, overboard. And uh, they think they're going down. And then Jonah finally says, well, it's me. I'm in rebellion to God. Well, hey, it's just a blessing having you on board, brother. <laughs> Man, I just wish you'd sail with us all the time because I just threw my life savings into the ocean to try to save our life. You are such a blessing to me. As he has to confess who he is, that he is a Hebrew, and he worships the God that has brought this all about. Uh, and then he says, throw me overboard and you're going to be okay. I think we can do that. <laughs> but uh, at great loss to themselves. And it's uh, what a killer of a witness it can be, right? When we compromise, when we're not in the will of God. <clears throat> Abraham, it's not that Abraham doesn't love God. It's not that Abraham has forgotten God. He's just, he just hasn't been trusting God. And in a time of absolute severe trial and testing, he's just like, I'm going to figure out how to do this without God. Never, never a good idea. What could have happened to, again, to Sarai? Well, she could, have come, she could have become one of Pharaoh's wives. What would happen to the promise of the Redeemer? Well, God's not going to let that happen. So he overrules. Abram remains silent under Pharaoh's reproach, not saying a word, in a sense, goes back to Israel, to Canaan, with his tail between his legs, so to speak. I was going to say that, in a sense, God saved his bacon, but being that he's Jewish, probably we could say God saved his bagels. But either way, God <laughs> intervenes and gets him back to the place. But God intervenes, and he sees it, and he, and he recognizes it, and he does something about it. And that's what takes us to uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Abram repents, returns to the Lord. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So Abram repents, he returns. And again, because he's, he's seen God's supernatural intervention. 
You know, even, even in our sin and our rebellion or not trusting the Lord, we, uh, we still see God's working in our midst. And we see that God's there. And, you know, the, the Bible says it's his goodness that leads us to repentance. Did Abraham see God's goodness in this? I think so. I think so. And it, it drives him back to the Lord. So he repents and he returns to the land. Uh, not leaving him to his own devices. It's been said that no failure is permanent in the school of faith. Yeah, he's failed, but he's going to go back to that life of being a pilgrim and a stranger. Notice he also returns to Bethel and to the Lord. And uh, a, car- you know, a casual observer, again, could look at all of this and say, well, it wasn't all bad because he got to keep the Lexus. He got to keep all the Mercedes. He got to keep the Lamborghini. And apparently he's heavy invested in gold and silver in case there's any inflation. I don't know if you caught that or not. But, uh, you know, it seemed, you could say he came up pretty good on this whole thing, even though he was out of God's will. But notice what else he brought back from, from Egypt. The expanded or great wealth we'll see as we continue next week began to create problems with he and Lot. There's fighting, there's infighting now going on within his family. It created problems in his family because of when they came out of Egypt, they brought a little bit of Egypt with them. They also brought a lovely young handmaiden named Hagar. Pretty sure that's still causing a few problems in the Middle East today, right? As later on, once again, Abraham, now Abraham and now Sarah, are not trusting the Lord to bring that promised child. So she cooks up the idea. She's a little bit of a schemer too. She cooks up the idea, well, take my, my handmaiden, Hagar, and have a child through her. It's culturally acceptable, and it'll work out. We're just going to help God fulfill his promises to us. And, of course, that creates then all kind of stress and problems and strife within their family, and then she uh, uh, and her child uh, are basically dismissed and sent off. God protects them. In the process, we have the Arab people being created. Again, a little bit of a problem for the nation of Israel today. Uh, a third thing that we see in this as we continue is that Lot himself, when there is going to need to be a division between his herdsmen and Abraham's, Abraham, of course, says, well, you choose. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. And... Um, which was a little bit of an easy decision for him because it didn't matter wherever he went, God was going to bless him. Uh, But he allows Lot to pick. And what Lot does, we'll see next week, he looks out at a little city across the plains called Sodom. And he says, you know what? That reminds me of Egypt. And I kind of liked it while we were there. And he heads to Egypt. What happens to Lot in the end? Well, Lot, in a sense, comes out of Sodom, as you know the story, with his wife and his two, children, his two daughters, uh, loses uh, his wife along the way. Yeah, he's a righteous man, the Bible says, but he has nothing in the end. And he contributes nothing to the advancement of the kingdom of God or God's plan of redemption. Is he still saved? The Bible says that he, that he is. But I don't think any, any of us want to be there. There was, there was major repercussions. Again, God doesn't allow us to sin successfully Here's a a dad, a husband, a father, making horrible decisions on behalf of his family, and his family kind of reaped the consequences. Uh, Very unfortunate. There's never a benefit from disobedience. In terms of practical lessons, never abandon your altar. Remember, that's where we left him. In that altar, uh, before the Lord, worshiping the Lord, proclaiming the name of the Lord, Again, speaking of his character, his nature, his promises, worshiping him, trusting him, that's where he should have stayed. Even when the trials came, that's where he should have stayed, in fellowship and in fellowship with other believers. Now, just those words alone kind of take us to uh, a phrase of Jesus in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, opening chapters, writing to the seven churches in Asia Minor, commending them for the things they were doing right condemning them for the things they were doing wrong. And you remember the words of the church there in Ephesus. A good church, a church established by Paul, uh, a church that had uh, Timothy there as their pastor for uh, a number of years and was thriving. Well, we're only 30 years into this church. Uh, and, uh, and here, Jesus, in about 90 AD, is saying to this church through the apostle John uh, some very good things. You guys have held to the word of God. 
uh, which a lot of churches don't. Uh, you're still teaching the Word of God, which a lot of churches don't. You're still doing tremendous ministry out in the community, which a lot of churches don't. You're still doing many good deeds, even in the face of persecution, which a lot of churches don't. But he says, I have this to say to you in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. NIV says you've forsaken. It's a little stronger. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. From where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place uh, unless you repent. Jesus says, if you don't repent, I'll come re remove again that menorah, uh, a picture of his presence. That's what happened, isn't it? No big thriving church in Ephesus. By the time we move on into the second and the third century, uh, it really ceased to exist. Such a great beginning. And they had all the right doctrinal truth. No passion. <laughs> No fashion. You've forsaken your first love, your love for me. And because of that, you can have all the right teaching, all the right doctrine, but I'm not pleased with you, and I'm going to remove my presence. Don't just go through the motions, Jesus says. Don't just have the right doctrinal truths, but have it mean something into your own life. So what do you do when you find yourself? Well, Jesus says you repent and do what Abraham did. You return to those first works. For Abraham, he goes back to the place where he got off track. Sometimes I'll be talking, Kathy and I, to a married couple that's maybe having some, uh, some issues. And sometimes I'll, I'll say, especially if they're just a little bit agitated with one another, uh, I'll say, uh, well, when was it not like this? As they kind of go through uh, some of the issues they're, they're dealing with and so forth. And, uh, and sometimes it was months. Sometimes it was years. Uh, but there, there was a, can, can we go back there? Can we find a way back there when you, when you loved each other and had a passion for one another? Can we figure out what, what happened between here and there? You know, and God says the same thing to us. You know, even, of course, stay at the altar. Don't get out of God's will. Uh, if you do, he goes with us, watching over us in our sin and then doing things to get us to come back to himself, showing us his goodness that it might lead to our repentance. And when he does, he says, come back and come back with a passion. A.W. Tozier says, God will take nine steps toward us, but he will not take the tenth. He will incline us to repent, but he cannot do our repenting for us. He's there, the father of the prodigal son in Luke 15, waiting for our return. Uh, Rabbi Zacharias in his book, uh, Jesus Among uh, Other Gods, tells the story about uh, returning to a place in India, uh, the place of his birth, a place famous for saris, you know, the, again, the six yards of fabric that are wrapped around these beautiful gowns that the, uh, uh, the gals uh, wear there. I mean, it's incredible. They're wearing them out digging ditches and breaking up rocks on the side of the ground. I mean, it's just what they wear all the time. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of a uh, uh, such a uh, you know ironic thing to to see it, but uh, very very beautiful garments. There are special ones, of course, for a wedding that are woven with gold and silver threads. He's in the city that is world famous for their wedding saris. So his friends are going to take him where they're being made, uh, and he talks about the fact that he expects to see, <laughs> you know, beautiful machinery. They're so uh, so precision made uh, in everything and. Uh, and when he gets there, it's not the image he had in mind. They're being made by a father and a son by hand. The father is sitting on a loom three feet above the son. The son's underneath. Uh, and the father's up there. And in his mind, uh, Dr. Uh, Zacharias explains, he, he knows what the design's going to be. <clears throat> He's placing the threads in the loom. And then periodically, he just nods to his son who moves it one side and back to the other. Uh, and this goes on for hundreds of hours until the garment is done. All the time, the sun, all he sees is the loose fabrics hanging underneath, unaware of the design and what's in the mind of the father above. And the father simply needs to just nod, and the son will do what he needs to do. And about this, he says that uh, the son had the easy task, just to move at the father's nod. All along, the father had the design in mind and brought the threads together. 
The more I reflect on my own life and study the lives of others, I'm fascinated to see the design God has for each one of us if we would only respond to him. It's tough when times are tough, but it's probably the most critical times that we, we do. And it's easy, you know, the hindsight to look back, if I had only, and I saw God doing, and if I had just followed, if I had just, you don't want to get there. You know, you want to be able to just, when the Father says, do the, just that simple nod, yes, Lord, and learn to trust him. We don't always see the big picture. He has a design in mind. He's painting a beautiful picture out of our lives that involves severe trials and testing, but he's doing it for a purpose. He doesn't want to leave us in kindergarten. It's okay for, you know, a four or five-year-old. It's not okay for somebody a lot older than that. And uh, we don't want to remain there in terms of our faith. Let's pray.